Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have two hours of horror stories as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated, as I do post content just like this all of the time. Anyways, sit back, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I've made a living off of exposing magic tricks. I'll admit I was never able to make a big name for myself on performing magic alone. I did alright with my partner, but I found that revealing many famous tricks and teaching others how to perform magic has become a far more lucrative career for myself. I'm always excited to be presented with a new challenge for a seemingly impossible trick. I take great pride in my ability to reveal even the most challenging of magic tricks. Until now, that is. Because I've seen something that I truly cannot explain. I was recently at a book signing of mine. A decent crowd had showed up, eager to pick my brain on the current state of magic and my opinions on it. Well signing, an old colleague of mine arrived. His name is Ronaldo Cruz. It had been years since I'd seen him. Without exchanging words, I greeted him with a hug. Ronaldo was a partner of mine back when I had first begun performing magic. Together we were the ravishing Ronaldo and Reginald. A joke we would share was that he was the ravishing one, and I was just Reginald. We were no Siegfried and Roy but we had a respectable run on the Las Vegas Strip. It was not enough to make a full career on, but it got my foot in the door. After a few years of practice, we decided to go our separate ways. There was no animosity toward one another, but we had different philosophies. We both enjoyed learning the secrets of magic, but he believed that it should remain a secret. Of course, I did not follow that ideology. When I pulled him close, he did not seem to reciprocate any of it, and he felt cold. While I pulled back to take a good look at him, he was different than I once knew. His once tan and full face had turned white as a ghost. His face was sunk in, creating a gaunt appearance. I blamed it on aging, but this was certainly not the ravishing Ronaldo I once knew. One thing that did not change were his over-the-top green alligator shoes. They'd become sort of a staple of his look to go along with his ravishing character. How have you been? I asked. I need your help with something. He responded. He didn't acknowledge my question, although his response told me that something wasn't right. I don't want to talk about it here. He reached his hand into his pocket and extended a piece of paper over to me. I unfolded it to reveal a crumpled up photo of an old dive bar we frequented together. Name of the place was Andy's. A real quiet hole in the wall we'd go to if we wanted to lay low. A slight smile crept across my face. Certainly he's just messing around with me and just wanted to have a few drinks. I thought to myself. Immediately after agreeing to meet with him in two hours, he marched out the door of the bookshop. I arrived at Andy's about 15 minutes early and headed to our usual booth. Ronaldo was already there, halfway through his second whiskey on the rocks. When I sat down, I noticed that he kept looking around as if to see if anyone else was following us. Once I sat at the booth, I decided to break the ice with a simple question. So Ronnie... What brings you back to Vegas? He paused for a moment and looked into my eyes. I could sense there was fear and paranoia going on in his mind. I grew more concerned that he had gotten himself into a really bad situation. I need your help, Reginald. His voice quivered slightly when he spoke. You see, I saw something recently that I can't explain. It was at some traveling magic show back in Missouri. He took another drink from his whiskey. 
It was nearby. I thought it'd be a fun little show. The performer's name was The Crimson Mask. He started off the show doing the basic stuff. Levitation, card tricks, and some sleight of hand. But during the final trick, he brought me on stage and... He paused again and took a larger drink from his glass. I can't explain it. You know me, Reginald. I'm a skeptic and realist, just like you. But what I saw? It's not possible. For weeks I've gone through it over and over and over again, but there's nothing. I could tell by his demeanor and tone of voice that this was no act. Whatever it was he'd seen, it had truly startled him. I'm reaching out to you because you're the only one I know who has a chance of solving this. Someone to prove that I'm not losing my mind. Whether or not he was losing his mind, his fear was real and I could not help but take pity on him. Alright, Ronaldo, Let me help you. What is it you saw? Ronaldo remained silent for a few moments before answering. If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. It's something you have to see to believe. He slid over a small red ticket. It read, You're invited to see the incredible Crimson Mark Magic Show, March 21st. Show starts, 7pm. Show ends, 11pm. 808 Park Theater, Las Vegas, Nevada. On the back of the card, there was a handwritten phone number. Once it's over, call me. But I warn you, Reginald, once you've seen it, there's no going back. He finished his drink, paid his tab, and left without another word. To ease his mind, and my own for that matter, I decided to track down this Crimson Mask character and observe what frightened Ronaldo so much. The show took place in a fairly rough part of downtown Las Vegas. It felt like walking into an old abandoned theater. There were some parked cars outside, so at least I wasn't alone. When I arrived at the counter, an elderly man took my ticket. He gave me an eerie smile and said, Enjoy the show. It was a small crowd, but not completely dead by any means. I was seated in the center about three rows back from the main stage. When it started, a speaker over the intercom introduced. The Incredible Crimson Mark. His name sounded more like a superhero than it did a magician, but I digress. I suppose I can respect someone trying something a bit new. He appeared on the stage by a puff of smoke. Not an original entrance, but again, I digress. While my career is mostly dedicated to debunking magic, I cannot help but be a critic at the same time. The show began fairly typical. He wore an all-black suit with a metallic crimson opera mask with two black voids around the eye sockets and a black hood. He was silent. All of the dialogue in the show was done through the speaker. At first, he did the basics. Levitation, card tricks, disappearances. All of them easily identifiable through trap doors. Well-colored cables and good old sleight of hand. I began to smile. Certainly my friend Ronaldo was putting me on. Back in the day, he was never afraid to pull a joke on some of his friends. I was moderately amused by this thought. Until the last trick, that is. Alright, ladies and gentlemen. For the final act of the night, we'll need a volunteer from the audience. The voice on the speaker said. The entire place went dark except for a singular spotlight on the top right balcony of the stage. It slowly panned over the audience until it landed on... You guessed it. Me. At this point, I felt confident this entire thing was an elaborate rib for myself. The crimson mask was probably Ronaldo himself. I must admire the dedication he has had towards introducing this new character. After all, what were the odds I would be the one selected from the crowd? I was welcomed onto the stage and placed about 10 feet away from the Crimson Mask. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the final act of the night, the incredible Crimson Mask will perform what he calls 
the double take. As we stood across from one another, he remained still and silent for almost a minute as some creepy piano music played over. Then he brought his hands up to his face and removed his mask to reveal himself. It was me. I rubbed my eyes because I was certain I was hallucinating, but I looked again. It was still me. It was like looking into a mirror. It wasn't a mask. It couldn't have been. It was too perfect. It couldn't have been a long lost twin either. It was more like a perfect clone of me. My eyes, my nose, even a light scar above my left eyebrow from when I knocked my head on the swing set as a child. Down to the last detail. It was perfect. This wasn't right. In that moment I froze. I was completely spellbound. Not since I was a child had I felt something like this before. No, it's not possible. I must be hallucinating or dreaming. This couldn't be real. It's my face. It's my face. It smiled back at me. It seemed amused by my disbelief. The initial shock began to wear off and fear jolted through every vein of my body. It walked closer to me. I think I tried to move away, but I couldn't. It's like my feet had been welded onto the stage floor. It stood across me, inches from my face. It took my hand and placed it on its cheek. My cheek. The flesh was warm and tender. It was real. Whatever I was touching, it was real. I pulled my hand away and the thing backed up about five feet. I turned away toward the audience, hoping that when I looked back, it would have gone away. That this momentary loss of sanity would return itself. But when I looked out into the audience, there was no one. The theater was completely empty. When I looked back, it was still there and it was still wearing my face. All I could say was, what is this? Then just as it arrived, the crimson mask disappeared into a puff of smoke. I looked out into the audience again. There was still no one. All the lights and speakers came back on. Thank you for attending the incredible Crimson Mask. Please begin making your way to the exit doors and have a wonderful evening. I quickly snapped out of this frozen state and ran out of the building. I heard the sound of a malicious cackle over the speaker until I reached the parking lot. All of the cars I'd seen there before were now gone. It was just an empty lot. I bolted back to my apartment to try and make sense of this. I tried calling Ronaldo, but there was no answer. I tried to take a step back from the situation for a moment. There could still be a rational explanation for this. I tried looking up the incredible crimson mask, but I found nothing. I tried looking up the building's owners, but I came to find there were none, and that the building itself had been abandoned for nearly five years. For weeks, I went through everything I'd ever learned about illusion. I went through books, audio cassettes, VHS tapes, but there was nothing I could find that could rationally explain a perfect doppelganger. As rational possibilities began to fade, I began to look at irrational possibilities. Was I drugged, hypnotized, kidnapped and brainwashed? Did they finally perfect those Mission Impossible masks? Was it an android? I couldn't come to any logical conclusions. The only one that made sense was that I was going mad. For weeks I couldn't sleep, eat, or even go outside. In the mirror, I noticed my skin was losing color. My body and face were becoming more gaunt, just like Ronaldo. I attempted to reach him several times through the phone, but he never picked up. After a few months, I tried to forget about the entire ordeal and move on with my life, but of course, I couldn't. Strange things began to occur. I constantly felt as though I was being watched. Sometimes, I would see that thing again, usually in a crowd. It would be wearing my face, or that awful mask. 
I tried to pursue it, but it would disappear before I got too close. Sometimes it'd look like friends or family members of mine, but I could tell it wasn't them, just by looking at its smile. Everything that I once knew about the world had been challenged. My logical reasoning and understanding of the known universe could not help me here. I decided that I needed to find Ronaldo in the hopes that he would have some answers. Through a few associates of mine, I found that he was living in a small town in the Ozarks. I booked a flight there immediately. When I arrived, the exterior of his home was in pretty rough shape. His lawn was completely overrun with weeds. His front porch was covered in them. I knocked on the door. No answer. The door was unlocked. I wouldn't normally do this, but I was desperate and needed to see if he'd come up with any answers. I made my way into his home. Whole place smelled like rancid garbage. It was so horrid that I had to cover my mouth with my sleeve. I called out his name, but I heard no response. I walked into what appeared to be his office. The entire place was a mess of books, newspaper clippings, empty whiskey bottles, and scraps of paper. It was apparent that this incident had caused both of us to go insane in the search for an answer. As I was looking through his scraps, I felt something tap my shoulder. I instinctually turned my entire body to see what had touched me. It was Ronaldo's gator-skinned shoes. I couldn't process it at first. Why are his shoes hanging up like this? Then, I looked up to see what they were connected to. It was Ronaldo. He had hung himself in his office with a leather belt. Immediately, I called the police and told them what had happened. Most of it, anyway. I decided not to share the full experience out of concern they'd throw me into a mental hospital. They told me he'd been deceased for a few weeks. In his home, they found a note. It was addressed to me in an envelope. It read as follows. I'm sorry for bringing you into this, Reginald. I truly believed that you could make sense of this, but I realize now that it's not possible. What I've seen is no trick. I've researched into everything imaginable, but have found nothing. I've seen that thing several times since I attended the show. Sometimes it'll look like me. Sometimes it'll look like a friend. And sometimes it'll just be a stranger. But I know it's there. Just by the way it smiles. One time it even looked like my father who's been dead for ten years. This is not an illusion. It's real. The thing we've come across is beyond our comprehension. All our lives we've been experts at distorting the perception of reality in order to trick our audience. But this being is capable of actually changing it. I haven't been able to sleep or eat in weeks. Knowing something like that exists out there has forced me to live in a constant state of fear and helplessness. I cannot go on like this anymore. If you can, Reginald, move on from this. Try to forget it all and just move on with your life. But I know you, and I know that won't be possible. I've left you something else in the envelope if you wish to continue down this rabbit hole. There is no trick this time. Goodbye, old friend. God be with you. My heart sank to my stomach as I read through it. I couldn't believe this was real. Yet some part of me remained adamant that there was still a logical explanation for all this. Despite my friend's warning, I knew that I had to find an answer. In the envelope, I found what he was referring to. It was a small red piece of paper, a ticket to another nearby show of The Incredible Crimson Mask. It's scheduled tonight at 7pm. It's 6pm now. I can't tell you the name of the place this story is about. I signed an NDA when I joined this big company I used to work at. Which means, even after everything that's happened, I can't tell you the name of the company either. 
just that it manufactured heavy industrial chemicals. I started working there about five years ago as a facilities manager, which basically means a glorified receptionist. I sat at the main desk in the lobby of their corporate headquarters and checked in visitors, delivery people, repairmen, etc. all day long. It was also part of my job to take care of the dozen or so vice presidents who ran the place from the 13th floor, scheduling meetings, setting up lunches, that kind of stuff. These vice presidents, they were very busy. The kind of people who'd keep losing things. Watches, keys, wallets. When I found them, I kept them in a drawer in my desk until I could figure out who they belonged to. It was a small part of my job, but it was humiliating. It was stressful work, but the pay was okay and I needed the health care. I have a daughter, Sandra, and I'm raising her alone. She's almost grown now, but when this story takes place, she was only 13. Being a single parent means that when your car breaks down and your kid has to get to school and you're late for work, you don't really have anyone to turn to. You just go to work late. This sort of thing happens, though. You get put on probation. And when you get your third strike, you get fired. Or, in my case, you get a choice. The pink slip or the night shift. Not that that's much choice. I didn't like the idea of leaving Sandra alone at night, but luckily my manager told me I could bring her to work with me. She just had to stay out of sight and not make a peep. Sandra was a pretty quiet kid, so it wasn't a problem. Sandra mostly did her homework, then slept on this little cot in the first floor storeroom. We also watched videos on my phone when no one was around. Sometimes I told her stories about the village we were from. She loved to hear those stories. I felt guilty, but I was grateful not to be in that big old 70s era building by myself at night. Sure, there was less work to do than during the day. I could take my night courses online when Sandra was sleeping. I was about halfway to getting my MBA then. It took a long time, but it was worth it. I don't know if you've ever been in an old office building at night. The kind of building where the HVAC system screams like a banshee when the furnace turns on. Where the halogen lights and the drop ceilings flicker like sinister fireflies for no reason. Where there always seems to be someone lurking in the next cubicle. It isn't fun. But after a while, I got used to it. And then one night, I heard something in the elevator shaft. A rattling which became a clanging. Sandra was doing her homework, sitting underneath my desk like she always did. She looked up and asked me what that sound was. I didn't know. But I smiled like everything was going to be okay. I got up and moved towards the elevator doors as the noise rose. It sounded like someone was trapped back there, trying to bang their way out. Mom, be careful. Sandra said. I told her to get back behind the desk. Right when I got to the elevators, there was a slam behind them. I jumped back and then the doors opened. The elevator had arrived. Everything had gone back to normal. I walked back over to Sandra, who was looking at me with concern. But she didn't seem scared at all kids. The rest of the night was normal. I took Sandra home at 6 a.m. She got ready, then I took her to school. When I got home and crawled into bed, I got the phone call. They had found the body of one of the vice presidents on the 13th floor. I rushed back to the office. No one would let me see the body, but I heard it was gruesome. The cops had reviewed the security footage, and they wanted to know about the elevator incident. When I told them what had happened, they thought it was pretty funny. I couldn't sleep at all when I got back home. The man who had died wasn't a good person. Like most of the senior staff, he treated me like I was disposable. But he was still a human being. That night, I told Sandra she had to stay home at night from now on. She was old enough to be by herself. I thought she'd be delighted, but she wanted to know why. 
When I told her, she said she was frightened. I thought maybe she was a little excited. A mysterious death. A big adventure. She was staying home. I put my foot down. I thanked God later that I did. Because that first death was only the beginning. One by one they died. The vice presidents. They would stick around after hours, working on some big client presentation or whatever. And they'd be found dead the next day, splayed on their desk. Curled up in the corner of the copy room, or pressed up against a boardroom window. Their fists curled against the glass like they were trying to break their way out. They'd all died of asphyxiation. At first the cops thought there was a problem with the furnace. But nobody could find anything wrong with it. Then there was a matter of the dead men's skin. It had reddened, sloughed off, basically peeled away, like it had been exposed to toxic gas. I was there every night. It was terrifying. I would be too scared to leave my desk, so I'd put off going to the bathroom, then I'd run quickly to the ladies. One night, I swore I could hear someone in the next stall speaking low and chuckling in a really nasty way. But when I got up the courage to throw open the stall door, there was no one there. A few nights later, the elevator wasn't working, and I had to go up to the 13th floor to turn off some lights which had mysteriously turned on. You can bet I didn't want to do that. When I was coming back down the emergency stairwell, I heard the sound of dozens of feet coming down after me. I sped up, but they started coming faster, then faster and faster. I ran like hell never looking behind me, not once. When I got back downstairs, I shoved an extra chair in front of the stairwell door, just to be sure. The last one was the worst of all. One night I was getting a report for a courier pickup when I saw a figure across the sea of cubicles. It was hunched over in the halogen light. It looked skinless, like it had been flayed, but it seemed to be smiling. Then all the lights went off. I screamed, went still, waited. I could hear the thing coming closer to me, closer and closer. I shut my eyes and then the lights came back on. Slowly I opened my eyes and saw that I was alone. I never told anyone about the strange things I saw. They would have thought I was insane. I thought about quitting my job, but then Sandra and I would have been destitute. I was behind on the rent as it was. I had to keep going to work. I never told Sandra about any of this, but she could see the stress it was causing me. She did more than her fair share of chores. Even cooked a bunch of the meals. I had never seen her act that adult before. I felt bad about it, but also really proud. Meanwhile, none of the authorities or the experts the company hired could find any signs of chemical spills in the building. People who worked there began to freak out. Rumors spread like wildfire. There's a fungus in the walls that kills people. There are gas packets in the vents that make your skin slough off. And my favorites, it's ghosts. To understand that last rumor, you have to know something about the company I worked for. About 25 years ago, there was a big chemical spill at one of our plants in a foreign country. Killed almost 400 people who worked there or lived in the nearby town. There was a small out-of-court settlement, barely $100,000 made to survivors. The company never admitted fault. That's where the NDA comes in. I can't tell you the name of the place where the chemical spill happened. I can't even tell you the country it was in. I can tell you it was horrible. That the inside of people's throats melted off. That they coughed until they vomited blood. That they died writhing and screaming and in tremendous pain until they finally asphyxiated. Just like the vice presidents. You can see why people thought it was ghosts. The vice presidents didn't believe in ghosts. The four of them who were still alive got together in the big boardroom on the 13th floor late one evening. 
they put their heads together trying to figure out who was targeting them. Was it corporate espionage? Some kind of eco-terrorist? Maybe an employee they'd fired? They deliberated for hours. The next morning when their underlings came to work, they found the vice president in the boardroom. Their skin peeled off, their eyes exploded. Their faces had claw marks from their fingernails, as if their skin had burned so bad they'd been trying to claw it off. That's when the company shut down the building, cleaned out the corporate headquarters, put it up for sale. The death stopped after that. The facilities managers had to pack up every floor. I wasn't there when this happened, but some of my coworkers were moving boxes out of an old storeroom on the 13th floor and found a bunch of paperwork that proved that the company had cheaped out on the construction of the plant where the chemical spill had happened. The vice presidents had all signed off on it. They had known that there was a high probability of a chemical spill. They just didn't care. Somehow this paperwork found its way into the hands of a young reporter in need of a scoop. Now the company's assets have been liquidated and divided between the survivors of the chemical spill. The company where I worked doesn't exist anymore at all. Good thing I got my MBA. On the day before the building's sale was finalized, I realized that I hadn't cleaned out my desk. I drove back over. I felt my heart rate rise as I saw the building on the horizon. My pulse was out of control as I used my security card to open the door and walk through the empty, cavernous atrium. Sweat clung to the back of my neck as I put all my stuff in the box I'd brought. When I finished, I was ready to run out that door for the last time. And then I realized something. None of the vice president's things had been in the desk drawer. I checked again, but there was no sign of them. I drove home slowly. I already knew the truth of what had happened, but I didn't want to admit it to myself. Sandra was still at school, so I went through her room. I found exactly what I thought I'd find. One other thing I guess I should have mentioned. The place where I'm from has this tradition. A lot of people my age don't believe it, but it's true. I know it's true. If you found something that belongs to someone you hate, you can curse them with a death they caused. It doesn't have to be a special object. Watches, keys, wallets, those all work. All the things the vice presidents lost, and that I found, and kept in my desk drawer. When Sandra came home, I'd made dinner. A traditional meal from the village we were from. She sat down. From the look on her face, I could tell she knew what was coming. Before I even said anything, she gave me a sad little smile and said, I'm sorry, Mom. I put the food down on the table and sat, let her speak. I was so angry with you when you took that job, Sandra said. Working for the company that killed so many of our relatives and neighbors. I knew you didn't have a choice, but I was still angry. Then you brought me to work that first night, and while you were in the bathroom, I went through your desk. I was just looking for a pencil sharpener, but I found their things. Suddenly I remembered what grandmother had taught me. She didn't want you to know. Said you were too modern, too Americanized. But she taught me, taught me how to curse them. What I would need, just a few simple herbs, and their things. When I saw what was in that drawer, I knew what I had to do. Sandra turned up her face. I could see that she was crying silently. I wanted nothing more than to wipe away her tears, but I knew she wasn't done with her story. I called them up, Mom. The ghosts. I didn't know what they were going to do, but I knew it would be horrible. I knew if I prayed hard enough, they wouldn't hurt you. Did they? She looked at me, her eyes pleading. No, I said. They didn't. But you were really scared. Yeah, I was really scared. Sandra hugged me hard. I'm so sorry, Mommy. I wish you didn't have to be so scared. But those men, they deserved it, didn't they? 
She looked at me again, waiting to see if her mother would tell her she was a horrible person. They did. I said again, and wiped my daughter's tears away. You might be thinking that I shouldn't allow my daughter to get away with such a thing. Well, those men who were killed, they got away with something far worse for years and years and years. They had plenty of people, lawyers and politicians and PR specialists to protect them. And Sandra has only me. But then, of course, Sandra can take care of herself pretty well. You might be wondering where I'm from, what kind of place has this tradition, and what you can do to ever avoid pissing off someone from there. But unfortunately, you'll never know. I can't tell you the name of the place I'm from. You ever just want to leave? I mean, pack up and leave? Fill a suitcase and take a train out of that place? Of course. It's only natural. The day hasn't gone by for years where I don't. See, out here in Iowa, there ain't much to do as you might imagine. Endless miles of rolling hills and cornfields. A boring beauty as some say. It's a place where creativity and some friends can do wonders. Only, I never really had either of those things. My childhood was tolerable. I was painfully average at best. I always managed to stay right in the middle. Two coast, just above the surface. I didn't get bullied, but I also never seemed to be welcomed by anyone or their friend groups. I felt like a discolored pixel. On occasion, I'd overhear my mother telling the next boyfriend how much of a good kid I was, and how I'd never caused them any trouble. God, how sometimes I wish I were that kid. Someone with a personality, at least, albeit an unpleasant one. I downshift from third gear and into second as I approach the light ahead. The lake is just around the corner. I should tell you about the lake. See, after I drive to my community college and sit through a few lectures that I'll never internalize, I usually head down to this park a few miles from our house. There's a small lake there, probably about 70 meters or so across. I'm not sure if it has a name. It's kind of one of those parks you just walk by, as there was nothing else to put there. The headphones go on, the synthwave music erupts into my ears, and then I begin. I take a carefully selected stone from my satchel, and I encase it meticulously with my forefinger and thumb. I raise my arm back and swing it forward, flicking the smooth stone towards the water. One bounce, then another, and another. The stone teases the lake, never telling when it'll give in probably never knowing. For that brief period, I see myself, coasting along, life becomes explainable. So I like to skip stones. It's the one thing I found out here that I'll do no matter what, almost every day. I started in my sophomore year of high school. I had this nasty argument one evening with my mom's ex-boyfriend, Henry and took a long walk over here to this lake. I had picked up a stone and threw it angrily at the lake, but it skipped a single time before plopping into the water. I tried again and again and finally managed to do it with more intention. I've been hooked ever since. I'm on to my fifth stone now. Usually I only carry about 10 that I'll hand select from the day before in my bag, but we'll start looking for more after I exhaust my supply. I don't always find the nicest stones off the bat, but this lake has some pretty good ones if you know where to look. Today there's this man sitting across the lake from me on a bench. I can't really make out the details of his face, but he's wearing what looks like a cool flat cap and a puffy black winter coat. His legs are crossed, and he has a newspaper in his hands. I don't quite remember when he got here, or if he was even here when I arrived. He's watching me though, despite the newspaper act. Nothing too off about that, 
If anything, I'm the odd one out. Now that I have a spectator, I almost feel like showing off a little. Eight stones down and I palm the ninth. Assuming the finger configuration for launch. This one smacks the water and skids off promisingly. I count 30 skips, almost matching my personal record of 32. It nearly clears the entire diameter of the lake. As surprised and happy as I had been, the euphoria soon dies as I realize that among the best, it wasn't anything of note. An average throw, if that. I crouch down and robotically grab another. As I palm my tenth and final stone, I hear over my music, a loud applause from the other end of the lake. I look up and see that man, now standing and clapping with his gloves off. He gives a playful cheer, and I can hear the smile embedded within it. Thanks! I say with my best outside voice as I stand up awkwardly and remove my headphones. Say, kid, said the man, bearing what seemed like a thick and raspy Brooklyn accent. He put his gloves back on and placed his hands in his coat pockets. How many was that? Uh, like 30, I think, I said casually, trying to play off the effort. See, that's something else. You do this every day? Just about, I responded, again awkwardly raising my voice while trying to keep it below a yell. Funnily enough, the one conversation I have naturally with someone there across the lake. Tell me, what's the most you've ever hit? He further pried. By the way, I'm Angelo. Good to meet you. I'm Samuel. Most I've ever done was 32. Sheesh. Are you going for a record or what? Said Angelo. The record's almost triple that. I laughed. Probably not. Have some confidence, sir. Here, I like you, Samuel. You come out here every day and try to get better. If I see you skip one of your stones across this lake, I'll get you whatever you want. Sound good? A few things here. One, this guy became a genie out of nowhere. Two... He really does have a cool hat, but most importantly, even if this guy is out of his mind, maybe that's what I need. Something to try and reach for. Heck, maybe I'll get a free slice of pizza out of it or something. Deal, I say back, offering back a faint smile. Angelo gave a double thumbs up, walked back to the bench and folded up his newspaper before making his way up the pathway and out of the park. It was also about time I left, as we don't have those summer daytime hours up here yet. I skipped the last stone and quickly selected my roster for tomorrow, before heading back to the car. My mood dips again as I end my daily dose of pleasure and head back home. Whatever I want, huh? That's a weird way to offer someone a favor. Angelo has no idea who I am, or what I might ask for, so why make such an open-ended offering? Best not to think about that. Who knows if I'll see him again anyway. I pull into the driveway and see my stepdad Brian sitting on the porch. Brian's not my favorite human being. See, Brian is an alcoholic that's twice my size. Game day? Cool. He's getting wasted and shouting at my mom. Did a stranger stare at him weird earlier? Fantastic. He's getting drunk and shouting at my mom. The list seems to grow. It's gotten worse ever since he had a stroke and went on disability last year. Remember that ex-boyfriend Henry? I mentioned arguing with that times. Yeah, this guy is his evolved form. Only he also argues with my mother nearly every morning almost like a clockwork. I hear them start up. Sometimes a dish gets thrown, usually a door gets slammed. You get the idea. Hey Slim, says Brian. That's another thing. I'm quite skinny and he took the liberty to start calling me Slim. Creative and wholesome. Hey, I respond tepidly and make my way up the stairs to my room. Hey you Sammy? I hear my mom yell from the kitchen. Yeah, I'm just going to bed. 
All right, food's in the fridge if you want, hun. She said. Thanks. I'll never understand why a sweet lady like my mom puts up with these chumps. I set my bag down and hop in bed before putting my headphones on and passing out. This is the only method to get sleep reliably in this household, and I usually start the process pretty early. The next few days persisted as per usual. I didn't see Angelo at the park, but I tried extra hard to beat my record. I packed about 15 stones instead of the ordinary 10 and really went at it. I hit 35 skips on Wednesday, but I was a few meters short of the other side of the bank. Feeling rather confident yesterday, I skipped my afternoon political science class to see if I could catch Angelo, but he didn't show up yet again. It's now Friday morning and my iPhone alarm starts up. It's a calm 8 a.m. The sun's already out and I think today's supposed to be pretty warm. I said I didn't want that. Booms a man's voice from downstairs. Lovely. Brian's already losing it. I sit up, but then sink back into the bed and set my alarm for another 15 minutes. Might as well wait this one out before I try getting down there and showering. Then I hear the slam, followed by my mom letting out a cry. I jump up and race downstairs to the kitchen. My mom is on the floor. It looks like Brian pushed her across the room. Her forearm is bleeding. Brian looks at me as though I'm a fly that just pranced into a window he opened for only a few seconds. I can smell the alcohol in the air. I feel the anger in my neck sharpen, and the fear flicker within my legs as I lunge at Brian and swing my right arm towards his temple. He deflects my hand like I'm a toddler and pushes me to the ground. You're both parasites. I pay the bills and I'm on disability. Where's a good meal? Where's the help around here? I'm calling the cops, I threaten, as Brian grabs the keys to his truck and drunkenly exits through the kitchen. Mom, are you okay? What happened? Do you need an ambulance? I say softly as I run over to her. My lower back aches from the shove. I can see the fear and hopelessness as she meets my gaze, soon mutating into a look of disgust I have never witnessed from her. Where were you? She spat. I... I shouted for you and you never came. You're always out by the lake. I never see you around. I knew then that there was nothing to be said. I realized that my mother felt no security around me, that she couldn't trust me to be there for her when I was needed, that I was probably too busy wallowing in my own solitude to put in the effort around the house. Perhaps this has happened before, and I never would have known. I stood slowly and ran to my room. I grabbed my bag and fled to my car. There was only one thing I wanted to do. I raced to the lake and paced over to my spot. There he was, sitting on the same bench, wearing the same clothes, probably even reading the same newspaper. I don't say anything to him as I reach into my bag and pull out a stone. This one only goes for a measly ten skips. Not good. I only feel the frustration rise as I grab another one. This one will go further, surely. I flick it and watch it give in after only seven. Attempt after attempt, I flail my arms at the cursed lake and watch as I fall below expectations. Down to my last stone, I stop caring about the goal. What use is a goal if I'm the one kicking the ball? Hey Samuel yells Angelo across the lake. A piece of advice from someone who's never skipped a rock in his life. I look over towards him. He's standing up, posturing just like last time. Confident, nonchalant. Angelo, I really don't want to talk right now. Yes, you do. You just don't want to use your mouth. Talk through what you're doing. He responds firmly. I was expecting some cliché speech or lecture, but he's right. This is my outlet, not something I just do as a pastime. I eye the last stone and carefully wrap my forefinger and thumb around it. I caress the smooth sides. It's perfect and flat. As I raise my right hand behind me, 
I close my eyes and swing it forward. I think of all the stuff that happened this morning, and what my mom would think of me if I just landed that punch on Brian and sent him flying across the house. One, five, seventeen, thirty, forty, and... The stone leaps proudly from the bank's edge and lands just next to Angelo's right foot. It's done. The gloves come off again and I hear the applause sound from across the lake. That's my guy, says Angelo. I feel something leave my body, some blend of fear, inadequacy, and self-contempt. Wanna go grab some pizza or something? I ask Angelo. Is that what you want? Pause for a moment. A pizza would be nice, but the words, I'll get you whatever you want, reverberate in my head. Obviously, I wouldn't just use a wish on a pizza if I really had one. You said, whatever I want. You can give that to me? Yep. Angelo says matter-of-factly. Here, just write down what you want and leave it on the rock behind you. I always deliver. Angelo grins. There's no way this guy can give me whatever I want. But this felt like one of those afternoons where the Powerball is just so insanely high that you walk into a gas station and buy a ticket. I felt as though I needed to indulge, however unlikely it'd be to score big. Why not? I reach into my bag and grab my journal and a pen. I think for a moment, and I haven't, I slowly write to take care of Brian on the top line of the page, before ripping it out of the journal and leaving it on the rock behind me. I don't have the greatest sense of humor. But I thought it'd be funny for Angelo to pace around the lake after I leave and read that journal note. Maybe it'll spark a conversation next time I see him about who this Brian is, and why I want him gone. For now, though, I feel good. I feel able. Hey, Angelo. It's right over there for you. I've gotta head to class. I'm a bit late. I say, waving as I make my way up from my side of the lake. Alright, Samuel. See you at the crossroads, says Angelo with the trademark smile in his voice. I drive back to my college and sit through the remaining half of my Kelk 1 lecture before speeding home. I need to ride this wave. If I see Brian, I'll set him straight. I need to make things right with Mom. Most of all, as I pull into the driveway, my headlights now on from sensing the onset of dusk, I see a hooded figure jump over the fence of our yard. It looked like he was running away from my house. Weird. He looked familiar somehow. I pull out my keys and grab my bag heading inside. I hear shrieking from the kitchen. It sounds like my mom. I scramble into the kitchen and see my mother bent over a figure. It was Brian. She was embracing his head. Blood was staining her gown and hands. He was motionless. I was able to see two puncture wounds in his t-shirt, one over each pectoral muscle. My mother looked up and screamed. Mom, what happened? I shouted. She looked at me with bewilderment, a crazed fear. You monster, get away, you killed him. She cried, scrambling towards the other end of the kitchen. I... wait, what are you saying? I just got home. You... She repeated, grabbing for the house phone on the wall. It slipped through her bloody fingers and smacked the floor, lifting off and dangling from the wire. I killed Brian? No, no, how can she say that to me? Something's not right. I look over and see a knife on the floor stained in Brian's blood. I take my hoodie off and place it over Brian's gruesome wounds. The hoodie, that green high school graduation hoodie my mom bought for me a few years back. That man leaving the house. What color was his hoodie again? I swear it looked exactly like mine. Hello? Uh, yes, I want to report a murder. Yes, my son, he killed my husband. My mom alleged. 
staring at me menacingly as she spoke to the operator, following up with the address. I stared back at her blankly. This all felt like a fever dream. Whatever happened here, apparently, I, or someone who my own mother thinks is me, did this. I think back to the note I left for Angelo. There's no way he could have caused this, is there? I get one of those sinking feelings, like when you are being sent to the principal's office, or something stupid like that. The feeling of inevitable retribution. I knew that somehow, I'd never get out of this. I turn around and run back out the front door and start up my car. There's a half tank. Where do I go? No clue. I just need to drive. Down the back street I turn. About 10 miles down the road I pull over swiftly and get out. I recognize this place. A busted open fence leading to some old train tracks. I used to walk these tracks all the time back in the day. I squeeze through the opening in the fence and stare down in each direction. Oh man, how did this all come to be? I make a left and begin to walk further away from the house. Adrenaline still holding the trauma at bay. They'll probably catch me, and it won't be good. Is this what moving on looks like? On to the next realm of BS? The next thing? How much further can I walk before I see those red and blue lights? How long until the surface tension betrays me? I grew up in a small town, nestled on the banks of the River Rhine in Germany. It's a charming town, known for its lush vineyards and picturesque half-timbered houses. But for the locals, there's a peculiar tradition that defines our community. The skin exchange. Every year during the spring equinox, about 40 days before Walpurgis night, a kind of second Halloween here in the country, our residents gather to celebrate this unusual tradition. During the festival, the townspeople dress up as animals. The ritual dates back to ancient times when our ancestors believed that dressing up as animals would bring good luck and prosperity to the harvest. Although I grew up seeing the preparations for the festival and participating in the children's celebrations during the day, I never had the opportunity to participate in the adult version. After all, it's only allowed for adults. As a rite of passage, and I hadn't reached that age until this year. Me and my three friends, Anna, Johannes, and Lars, had planned this night for years. It's today. It's today. Anna shouted as we left school. I carefully picked out my mask. I wonder if I'll find my animal spirit tonight. She's always been fascinated by witchcraft, mysticism, and the like. Oh, it's not a big deal. At least it'll be fun to have an event to stay out late on the streets and drink a bit. That's it. Johannes always played the skeptic. I'm going more for culture anyway. Culture? Yeah, right. He was going because of Anna. Everyone always knew he had a crush on her. Everyone except the girl. Ah, whatever, Lars said, nonchalant as ever. Let's just have fun, okay? Where do we meet again? They all turned to me. I was the one in charge of these arrangements, sort of the leader of the group. Uh, it's at the end of the main avenue, just before the old road, where the procession starts. Be there at 8.30, okay? Throughout the afternoon, we exchanged excited messages about our costumes and what we would do during the party. The sun had already disappeared and the first stars were emerging when I finished my homework. I have a bit of OCD and I usually do these things as soon as possible, or else I really can't enjoy the weekend. I jumped back when I saw the time, rushing to the shower to take a quick bath and change. My mother was on the way. What's wrong, dear? She was already dressed for the occasion, holding a bear mask in her hands, the synthetic fur neatly braided in a brown tone. 
with its top covered by round ears. Late for the festival? Oh, yeah, we're already going, she said, pointing outside. Are you coming? I looked at the clock, 7.30. You can go without me. I'll be there later. I took a quick shower, and at exactly 8 o'clock, I was leaving home, my robe tied with a rope at the waist and the crow mask, with its beak projecting in front of me creating a small layer of air. I looked at my wrist, seeing 8.25 as I made the last turn to reach the agreed place. In the distance, I saw three figures standing in the way. They soon turned to me as I approached. It was them. Anna wore a fox mask. The fur carefully brushed upwards. Next to her, I couldn't distinguish the others, but I suppose Lars was the one wearing a deer mask, with decorative antlers extending beyond his head. And Johannes wore a wolf mask, with wild, piercing eyes and alert ears. You finally made it! Anna exclaimed, looking radiant in her costume. You're a little late, my dear crow friend. Johannes said, giving me a pat on the shoulder. Just a bit, Lars added with a mischievous laugh. Sorry, I was finishing up some things at home. I said, trying to disguise my haste. Let's go. We don't want to miss the start of the party. Together, we joined the crowd gathering in the main square. As we approached, the sound of laughter and music echoed through the narrow streets of the town. The colorful lights illuminated the way as we mingled with the other participants of the skin exchange. As we walked along the rustic road, Anna decided to share a bit more about the history behind the skin exchange. Her voice was filled with enthusiasm, as if she had prepared the speech for years. Did you know that the skin exchange dates back to ancient times? When our ancestors believed that dressing up as animals would bring good luck and prosperity to the harvest? She began, her eyes shining with excitement. They believed that by disguising themselves, they could connect with the spirits of nature and receive their blessings for the coming year. It's amazing to think how these superstitions have endured until today, Johannes commented. Yes, exactly. Anna enthusiastically agreed. And what's most interesting is how this tradition relates to Walpurgis Night. It is said that she rid Germany of witchcraft and pagans, so the festival represents a period of return to paganism, a kind of contrast with the celebration of Walpurgis Night that comes after recounting the story of depaganization. So, in a way, the skin exchange is a celebration of the duality between the old and the new, between paganism and Christianity. I added, impressed with the symbolism behind it. Exactly, Anna exclaimed, smiling widely. And that's why I've always found this festival so fascinating. It's like we're connected to our ancestral roots honoring the spirits of nature and celebrating life in a unique and magical way. Wow, why don't they teach this in school? Lars added. As Anna continued, now in a monologue, I could feel the contagious energy of her passion for the festival, and I found myself absorbed. For a moment, I forgot the oddities around us and allowed myself to be enveloped by the ancient history she was sharing. After all, there was something deeply captivating about the beliefs and rituals that shaped our small community over time. As we walked towards the meeting point, the air was imbued with the electric energy of the night. The city seemed to come alive with the flickering torchlights, and the sounds of drums echoing through the narrow streets. When we reached the main avenue, we joined the crowd of residents, all dressed in their wild costumes. Anna danced to the music, her fox dress gracefully moving with each step. Lars wasn't far behind, swaying his deer head back and forth in time with the beat. Johannes was more reserved, along with me, but even with a mask on I could tell he was watching the scene with a smile. The music now intensified, louder drum beats echoing through the trees, disturbing the natural stillness of the night. Now everyone was in a clearing, 
dancing in a circle around the bonfire. It looked like a sabbat. I think that's the word. Suddenly, my phone rang. Who would call at this hour? I thought. Still watching them bring more torches to be lit on the bonfire. I looked at the screen. Mom. Well, I hadn't seen her yet. I scanned the area trying to find her, but none of the bears there was a woman. I answered the call. Hi, Mom. I asked, trying to locate her among the crowd. Hi, honey. I'm with your dad here in the square. Are you coming? Her voice sounded excited on the other end of the line. The square? Yeah, I sent you the notice that it would be here. They decided last minute not to do the procession on the dirt road, remember? My memory hit me. We were so excited about the party that we forgot about that. But then... Son? Her voice came through the phone again. Where are you? I'm... I'm on my way. I replied to my mom, trying to keep calm as my mind spun in confusion. I hung up the phone and looked around. My eyes frantically scanned the masked crowd. I didn't recognize anyone. No one else from the town. No one but us. A shiver ran down my spine as I held on to the phone tightly. As the lights flickered and trembled, partially illuminating the revelers, realization washed over me. I understood what was happening. I frantically looked for Johannes. He was still leaning against a tree. I approached him cautiously, stopping a bit before him. Johannes? I called. Yes? He replied. I moved closer to him, near his ear, and whispered in a low voice words that still make me shiver to this day. They're not masks. My heart began to hammer in my chest as the words echoed in my mind. Johannes looked at me with a confused expression. He looked around for a while and seemed almost to stagger backwards. They weren't people dressed as animals. They were animals. Or perhaps something that looked very much like them. Johannes looked at me with an expression of disbelief. His eyes sweeping the crowd as if searching for some confirmation that what I had said couldn't be true. But as his eyes settled on the masked dancers around the bonfire, the horror that was in his heart became visible through his eyes. What do you mean by, they're not masks? He whispered, his voice trembling with fear. I don't know. I replied, my own voice now filled with uncertainty. But look at them. Those faces, they're really moving. It's their actual faces. Anna approached, her eyes confused as she listened to our conversation. I realized that the atmosphere around us was changing, becoming heavier somehow, and sinister as the unsettling truth seeped into our collective consciousness. Are you guys okay? She asked. I waited until she approached and told her about what we saw, about my mom in the square and everything else. She seemed to stifle a scream with her hand over her mouth. And what are we going to do now? She asked, her trembling fingers still clutching the fox mask to her face. Let's get out of here quickly, but without drawing attention. Where's Lar... A neigh interrupted my speech. There was a creature, something that I can only approximate to the appearance of a horse. Its head raised as it emitted the sharp sound. The music stopped. The silence was apprehensive as it turned towards us. The flames crackled, and their shadows danced. One by one, the other animals began to do the same, their wild expressions now seeming more menacing than festive. We started to walk carefully, but two or three steps later, and we were already running. Anna took the lead quickly, while I tried to keep up with that fast little fox. The creatures were now closing in on us, forcing us to deviate from the path. The girl who was leading us passed by, and... Her reasoning was quick. She managed to notice the guy with the deer head behind us. 
quickly pulling him by the hand. Okay, Lars is here. She shouted. I looked back to see Johannes almost stopping, fatigued. He had already removed the mask and now struggled to keep up with us, our hearts pounding wildly as we ran through the dark forest. The creatures pursued us, their heavy footsteps echoing behind us. As we dodged through bushes, we desperately tried to find a safe place to hide. Finally, we found refuge on a large rock on a tight slope. Breathless and trembling with fear, we crouched behind it, keeping as quiet as possible as the creatures passed by us, sniffing the air with their animalistic noses. What's going on? Johannes whispered, his voice trembling with fear. I don't know, I replied, my head spinning with confusion and terror, but we need to find a way to get to the square as soon as possible. We can't stay hidden forever. What? Anna asked. I can't hear anything with these things, she said, removing my mask. The feeling of freedom that accompanied the removal of the mask was overwhelming. My breathing came easier, and I could feel the cool night air against my skin. Okay, that was refreshing. I said, we need to go to the square. My mom will meet us there. I spoke as I enjoyed the fresh air. Right, she said, also removing the fox and now showing her thin face and dark eyes. Do you at least know where it is? I... I thought for a moment. I can't remember. This rush has disoriented me. And you, Johannes? He watched over the rock. Now the creatures had moved away. Look. I think I can find the way, but with difficulty. Lars is better at these things than me. I remembered Lars was with us. He must be very scared. Usually he was the most talkative of the group. I turned to talk to him. And then? My voice decreased gradually until the last syllable. Beside us, the face of the deer was turned to us, staring at us. Its antlers gleamed in the faint moonlight filtering through the treetops. Terror gripped us as we realized it wasn't our friend. Its empty eyes staring at us as if mocking our distress. It was having fun with us. That thing then stood up, raised its head and let out one of those strange noises we had heard before. Which by now, should have already alerted the others. We tried to run but it grabbed Anna's arm as she got up. She screamed in terror as she struggled to free herself from the creature's claws. Johannes and I ran to help her, our hands outstretched in desperation as we fought to push the deer away from our friend. But it seemed futile. The creature was strong and resilient, and its grip was firm as a press. Anna, hold on, Johannes shouted, his voice echoing in the darkness of the forest. He grabbed a heavy stone from the ground and hit it hard on the creature's arm. The beast howled in pain, dropping instantly and falling on its own arm, as if protecting it. We took advantage of the opening to escape. I ran like I had never run before, my lungs burning and legs trembling with effort. The forest was a maze of shadows and obstacles, but we couldn't afford to hesitate. After a while, we managed to get out of the main road, but we followed it from within the forest, hidden by the foliage mantle. The creatures mainly transited in the narrow, rustic path of beaten earth. They knew we were trying to get home. One or two were in the forest, but not enough, and we managed to go unnoticed. We're close to town, Johannes whispered. His voice mixed with the sound of our light footsteps. I could see the distant lights of the city beyond the trees. A comforting sight that urged us to continue. Finally, we emerged from the shadows of the forest and could see the main street in the distance. Where we came from at the beginning of the night. As we turned, I saw at the end of the street a person standing. It was a slimmer, feminine silhouette. I followed with my eyes, 
from her feet to her head, adorned with two round ears. Mom? I said as our eyes met. She walked towards us, her arms open for a hug, but as she approached, I noticed there was something wrong with her. Her movements were strange, awkward. A shiver ran down my spine as I watched her figure approaching with her contour taking shape. A strange shape. Son? She called, but her voice was strange. Almost a growl. Are you okay? Her words seemed to come from some distant place. A feeling of dread seized me as I struggled to understand what was happening. What? What's happening? I asked, my words coming out in a trembling whisper. She approached even closer, her hands reaching out towards me. But as she got closer, I could see that it wasn't my mother. Her face was distorted teeth protruding from his mouth and a large snout trembling where his nose should have been, and his hands, his hands were sharp claws ready to grab. My mind froze in front of that. I could see now, illuminated by the lamp post, every detail of those things, their bodies almost broken to stay upright, their fur disheveled, missing in some spots showing purple and pale skins. Maybe they weren't even animals. My hands trembled, but my legs stayed in place. Run, Johannes shouted, his voice full of panic pulling me by the arm out of that trance. Without hesitation, we ran in the opposite direction, our steps echoing through the deserted streets of the town. I looked back one last time and saw the sinister figure disappearing into the darkness, its fangs shining in the dim light of the moon. Finally we reached the safety of the main square, where my mother and father awaited us anxiously, already without their masks. We told them what had happened, but they looked at us with disbelief, as if they didn't believe our words. We should go home, my mother said. If you want to invite Johannes and Lars to sleep over, no problem, but enough of making up stories. We glanced at each other. Lars? He was in the forest. We created a confusion of sounds as we tried at the same time to tell my mother what had happened to him. It took a few moments for her to understand. Her expression turning serious. We ran to the police station where the sheriff listened to our story, taking notes at some points. Look kids, we warned everyone about the festival because some wild animals have been seen in the forest recently, especially a large bear. They don't usually track humans, but you never know. We'll let you know if we find your friend. Lars's parents burst into tears worried about their son, and we were even more concerned knowing that it wasn't a wolf we should be worried about. The night dragged on in a fog of nightmares and fear as we waited for news of our missing friend. Every sound in the darkness made us jump. Every shadow made us tremble with dread, but finally at dawn, we received word that Lars had been found, unharmed but disoriented, wandering through the forest. We rushed to find him, relief flooding our hearts as we saw his familiar face, without the deer mask this time. Lawlers never spoke about what happened, or at least he was in shock. His gaze fixed, crying and sobbing when he tried to do so. It's been a few years since that happened and nowadays we no longer live in our village. I moved to the capital, I'm finishing college and sharing an apartment with my girlfriend. I think you know her. Her name is Anna. Well, Johannes was a bit mad at me for a while after I started dating her, but he soon fell into the arms of another girl, and they're expecting their child now. Lars shows up from time to time. He works at sea on a ship crew. I'm writing this because every year at the same time I remember that. Our lives didn't turn upside down after that. We didn't enter a supernatural world or anything like that. It happened, and as quickly as it came, it was gone. 
Johanna still teases me to this day, saying it was a collective hallucination. But you know something I never told him? The sheriff that night said a bear had been spotted around there, but I recently learned that there are no more bears in Germany. Not for a long time. I don't have an answer for what that was. I do consider myself a bit skeptical. As I sit here looking again at my Google search history from the past few days, from the physical security of a two-queen hotel room, I realize that this is not something that happens to most people. So, my mom died about three months ago, on the afternoon of New Year's Day during a midday nap. My older sister had been watching her dad die two years ago at the age of 74. And it's been that steady decline you sometimes see with people who have been married forever and don't know how to live with each other. Dad got sick and died in a matter of weeks. And I knew mom was dying the day I sat in the back seat of my sister's SUV on the way back from his memorial. Not like medically dying. I mean that kind of poetically or metaphorically or metaphysically. She'd been with him when he took his last breath, she said, holding his hand and telling him how much she loved him. I didn't know what it was like to be with someone in their last moments, but I could only imagine the damage it would do to someone's head. My sister upended her life, moving from the suburb on the opposite end of the city to live with my mom and make sure she was taken care of. I would have done it, but mom never liked me as much as she liked Angela. She never said that, but considering my sister took the honorable route and got a job at an accounting firm while I was chasing open mic nights to practice my stand-up, it was pretty clear. It's whatever. Anyway, mom died in January, like I said. Angela took care of everything, which was lucky because if it had been my job, I don't know if I would have known what to do and I might have just asked some research center to come get the body and do tests on it. Mom would have hated that, and she wasn't going to be able to complain. Angela, the good kid, had Mom cremated. About a month after the big memorial service, Ange had invited all of Mom's friends and co-workers to. She texted me and asked if I would be interested in moving into Mom and Dad's old house with them. Sure, I said because they owned the house and it would save some money, and the stress of having three roommates, all human, not counting the four odd mice that I'm pretty sure slept in bed with me, in a two-bedroom apartment was wearing on me. Ange and I hadn't spoken too much in the last few years, since she was busy with her life and I was busy with mine. I tried to help where I could, but Angela had gotten so used to taking care of everything that she usually shooed me when I tried to help clean or cook. So I took some time to learn how to fix some things around the house with the plumbing or drywall or whatever, so I could at least feel slightly contributory during the day before I would go into the city in the evenings to find somewhere to tell my stupid jokes. I took on projects here and there around the house, finding that maybe DIY was my calling, and I was taking the mirror down in mom and dad's bedroom, where we'd never really been allowed to go to when I first discovered it. In that bathroom, I pulled the mirror from the wall, finding it was barely hanging on by a single rusty nail anyway, and behind it there was a small square of drywall missing maybe three inches by three inches. That in itself wasn't strange, but the smell coming from it was definitely something to not laugh about. It smelled like someone was roasting pennies over a campfire. I gagged and left the room, texting Ange right away to tell her I thought something might be rotting in the wall between our parents' bathroom and the laundry room next to it. Uh, gross? She'd answered and I braved the ick long enough to cover the hole with masking tape after the nail I tried to rehang the mirror on broke right off. I went to the furthest reaches of the house to hide from the smell, and I thought it was just sticking inside my nose or head or something before Ange got home, 
and was covering the bottom half of her face in disgust before she'd even come in the door. Nina, did you look in the hole to see what was in there? Angela demanded as soon as she got home. The whole house smells like used tampons and burning hair. A better description than the one I've given you, but maybe you get the idea now. We made a game plan, covering our faces with dish towels to stymie the smell, and taking breaks to go stand out on the sidewalk when the smell got too strong. I investigated the laundry room, finding where the other side of the wall was and I had to move a tall metal shelf where mom had organized all their towels and cleaning supplies in neat rows to find the wall behind it. There was a faint outline of what must have been a door at one point. It had long since been painted over, leaving only an indented seam where the door had once been. There was no handle, obviously, and if I had to guess, the hinges were on the other side. We'd grown up in this house. How was there a room we didn't know about? After showing Angela what I saw, she said she wanted to barf and we drove to the Holiday Inn Express to get a cheap room for the night. Since she'd made the good point that we would never be able to sleep with that smell throughout the house, I searched a few things on Google. Entire house smells like blood and burning. A gross search that yielded a few pictures of animals that had violently died in some people's vents. It was a possibility, but given the smell started the moment that hole came uncovered, I put those thoughts on the back burner. There was something in the hole. House records by address. The county we lived in had a handy search tool that told me mom's house was built in 1957, and that the blueprints for the house would maybe be on file in the county clerk's office. County clerk office email contact. I'm not going to wait until tomorrow morning to call. I heard back from the county clerk's office at 10 a.m. the next morning, and the lady had helpfully attached a PDF of the blueprints of the house, and I examined them as Angela dried her hair from her shower, carefully braiding it in anticipation of the gross day we had ahead. She'd taken a sick day off work after she hadn't slept well at the hotel, saying she didn't feel right working all day when the house seemed so messed up. The blueprints were pretty bad quality, honestly, but the faint lines were plenty for me to identify the bathroom where I'd found the hole. There was what appeared to be a linen closet there between the bathroom and the laundry room where I'd found the outline of the door, and when I told Angela as much, she asked questions I couldn't answer. How long had that closet been sealed off? Did mom and dad even know it was there? How long would a room that smelly take to clean? As we loaded up in the car, having checked out the hotel, I searched up a few more things. How to open a secret door in your house. The results were mostly YouTube videos on how to install a secret door. I didn't know the architect from Clue had a YouTube account. How to open a door that's been sealed shut. Mostly results from video games, but after some scrolling, I saw some people suggest that a sharp putty knife and a reciprocating saw might do the trick. Hardware store near me. The nearest one was about five minutes by car from the Holiday Inn. Ange let me go into the store by myself and I walked out $110 porver with an electric saw and a sharp, sharp knife. We got to the house and I went straight for the laundry room, instructing Angela to go to mom's bathroom and look through the hole and tell me if she saw light when I stabbed the seam between the door and the wall. She looked uneasy going into the bathroom, but I hadn't expected her to scream. Nina, get out of there! She shrieked from the front door, and I didn't question my older sister's instructions, booking it out right after her. What? What happened? I asked, closing the front door behind me. I could hear my heart in my ears, but Angela was turning an interesting shade of green. The tape was gone, she said quietly, turning around to empty our McDonald's breakfast in the garden, and then some. I wanted to puke too, but one of us had to keep it together. 
The masking tape being gone on its own was annoying, but not vomit-worthy. And I almost said as much, but she kept talking. The tape over the hole was gone, and I hadn't gotten the light on yet. But I saw an eye looking at me, Nina. There's a very particular fear in seeing someone very brave and collected completely losing it. And more than what she'd said, I was terrified because Angela clearly didn't want anything to do with any of this. You're sure? Angela walked out to the sidewalk, sitting on the curb and putting her head in her hands. There was an eye. It was looking at me. The second I screamed, it closed and moved away. I don't know. I feel like this makes me a bad sister, but I patted her on the back and said, I'm going to go to look again. It was probably a trick of the light, and since you were scared, your brain probably saw something that wasn't there. I'm so dumb. I've seen movies. Angela told me not to go, but when I insisted we couldn't walk away forever, she slowly nodded and said she would wait at the door while I went back in. The smell was stronger than ever now, and as I went into the bathroom, the sickly trepidation that made me want to vomit then and there was almost enough to turn me around. The door to the bathroom was still open, and I guess that Angela hadn't taken much care to mitigate the smell by keeping the door closed like I had. I reached into the bathroom before I went in, turning on the light to keep any tricks of the light and imaginary eyeballs at bay. The masking tape was on the floor of the bathroom, like it had been torn off in one chunk, and the hole remained dark. No eyes looked back at me, and when I shined my phone light into it, I didn't see much since the hole was so small. It was just me and the burning blood smell. There's nothing here, I reassured Angela as I left the bathroom. The tape probably just didn't hold up. I'm going to go back into the laundry room and try to get the door open again. She didn't move, nodding with her face still devoid of color. If she wanted to stop me, she didn't have enough air in her lungs to talk. So I walked around to the laundry room and picked up the stuff I dropped when she screamed and got back to work on the door. All in all, it took me about half an hour to carve through the thick coat of paint keeping the door sealed, and I talked to Angela the whole time, trying to stay casual despite the fact that I could feel my guts trying to get out through my esophagus. Whatever dead animal had gotten into that closet, the smell was going to hit me like a Mack truck, and I knew I had to be ready. The paint around the door came free. And to my disappointment and relief, it didn't just swing open and reveal its sordid secrets. I messed with the spot where a knob would have been for a bit, poking and prodding it with the putty knife. I hadn't been speaking to Angela for a moment so I could concentrate, and I managed to make enough of a gap in the door mechanism that I could get in there with my fingers and pull on the mechanism. I was so caught up in my celebration that I had figured out how the door could open, that when it came loose and opened a crack, I hadn't thought to hesitate and brace myself. The smell hit me like a tidal wave, and when I saw the mess inside I took a step back, choking and gagging. The bottom of the closet was littered with a substance I can only describe as similar to wet jerky, red and wrinkled and shiny. Curled in a corner in the back, retreating from the light of the laundry room, was a filthy and malnourished body, with wide bloodshot eyes trained on me. The skin around its mouth had been eaten away, forming a feral grin. Angela? I screamed, and as she came running, I stopped her so she wouldn't see what was inside. Call 911? I ordered, blocking the doorway. She turned away and I heard her speaking to an operator by the time she got to the front door. I took out my phone trying not to retch as my shaking hands tried to tap out one more Google search. How long can a man in his 70s be kept alive in a closet?
Do you avoid errands because you might bump into someone you know? Does the phone ringing make you break out in a panicky sweat? The school for shut-ins can help. Transform from shy, socially inept loner to life of the party. We can't make you an extrovert, but we can teach you how to fake it so well everyone will think you are. Grow from cocooned caterpillar to social butterfly in six weeks. Click to register. Wrapped up in my pajamas at my computer, I consider the link. No one can make me an extrovert, not even a fake one. You may wonder about me writing this post. Sure, I'm great online, but in person I can barely stammer two words. I turn red and sweaty and I panic fart. Which would be funny if I were a charming extrovert and could make a joke from it. But I can't, so I just die inside. Last phone conversation I had with my boss, I ended with, Love you, bye. Because the only phone calls I ever make are with mom. Needless to say, I quit my job. Just ghosted. Couldn't face the fallout of that. Okay, maybe I need this class. I sign up. Week 1. Week 1 opens with some pretty generic videos explaining types of anxiety. Those who are comfortable are asked to write an introductory post. Those who are not can fill out as much or as little as we want of a questionnaire. But at minimum, we need to pick a username. Mine is Frogger. There are 16 of us in total, and I'm surprised to find that a lot of my classmates have social anxiety even online. Only about half write an introductory post. Our other assignment is to journal about our biggest fears. I write. I'm worried that I am worthless and will never find love. I'm basically a female incel, and my greatest fear is that I will never like myself. There, I said it. I'm 22 years old. I obsess over everything I do or say. Every mistake I make burned forever in my brain. If this class can teach me to go out in the world, maybe people will like me. And if that happens, maybe I can learn to like myself even just a little bit. Week 2. We have our first Zoom meeting at the end of week 2. We're working toward week 4, which is the big week when we have our in-person meetup, which will require us to go to an actual cafe. We don't have to talk to anyone, we'll place our orders in advance, and our drinks will be waiting for us at tables with our usernames. We'll pull out our laptops and conduct class online, but we will have to be in the same space, breathing the same air, being together. It makes me nervous. I'm sure it makes everyone nervous. So to get us ready, week three is our first synchronous online Zoom. And to get us ready for that, week two is our first synchronous online chat. We only spend the last 10 minutes of class in the chat. Our instructor, Brandon, coaxes replies. Brandon, hey everyone, how are you doing? Okay. How about we all just say hi? Trudy. Hi. Brandon. Just type hi in the chat box, please, so I know it's working for you. Trudy. Hi. Frogger. Hi. Everyone is nervous, and two people have already dropped the class. We're down to 14 students now. Our instructor nonetheless applauds everyone, even those who only lurked. He tells us we are doing great. Week 3. Week 3 is our last online session. We join Zoom. On screen, our instructor smiles at us from the actual coffee shop where we will meet next week. Patrons sip drinks and bustle around him. The instructor cannot see us. Our cameras are off. But he invites us all virtually to pull up chairs with our coffees. Brandon is a pleasant, professional man in his mid-forties with red hair and a beard. Chubby and good-looking. Brandon says comforting things like, I won't expect you to talk. Don't worry. I actually love sitting in silence. Sometimes if I'm nervous, I pretend that instead of a person, I'm a cat. No one can talk to me because cats can't talk. 
That's how I used to convince myself to go out places. Not as Brandon, but as Cat Brandon. Wow, dorky. Makes me feel better about my own dorkitude. There's no pressure to say or do anything in the chat. After an hour, Brandon finally says that next week will be just like this. But we'll be in person. And remember, next week we're all cat people. We don't have to talk. We actually can't talk. It's not allowed, so don't be scared. But if you are, that's okay. You can be scared, cat, at your keyboard, just like today. And that's fine. Okay, Brandon. I think I can do the meetup. I'm ready for next week. Some people clearly aren't, though. We're down to only 12 students. Week 4. The coffee shop is exactly like it looked on Zoom. I find my seat with my name tag, which also has a cat version of me. We had to make these as homework and send them in. I can also see everyone else's cat versions. One person has a zombie cat, and another a cutesy animal cat, and of course there are house cats and meme cats. I sit down and take my hot cocoa and open my laptop and join the chat. Our instructor Brandon sits at a table nearby. He definitely saw me come in, but he doesn't look up, doesn't turn around, doesn't even make eye contact. He also has his cat picture up, a fluffy ginger tabby, cat Brandon. He can't talk either, per the rules. Okay, just a bunch of weirdos with coffee and cat pictures sitting around doing nothing. Check, can do this. I wish I weren't sweating so hard right now. My stomach's in knots. About half of the other students are here already, and I'm surprised at the diversity. A 30-something woman in sweats, a man who might be in his 50s, a teen girl who is the only person younger than me, with pale skin and haunted, sad eyes, dressed in goth style complete with smoky eye makeup. One guy, whose name is George, arrives late and says a nervous, Hi, hey to everyone as he sits at his place. We are all aghast. George, we're cats. You can't break the rules. No talking. Thankfully, George reads the room and stays quiet. Brandon's fingers wrap on his keys into the chat. Brandon, all here? Good, let's begin. Week four, post class. So the cat thing was actually pretty fun. In the chat, Brandon asked us each why we picked our specific cats. We could pass or engage. Then Brandon broke us off into pairs, to meet each other or to be quiet cats, if we didn't feel like talking. I even made one friend. Goth girl. That's her username, but I'll call her Gigi. Is the first person I was paired with. She's closer to my age, so I think I was sort of drawn to her to begin with. And she's kind of cute, and, okay, let's be real, I am never going to approach a cute girl IRL, but, like, from my keyboard? I asked her about her cat pick, which is this super creepy scary monster thing that honestly does not look like a cat at all. And she was nervous to share, so she told me to go first. Frogger. Uh, okay. Well, mine is a cat in a frog hat because I have kind of a weird frog face. Gigi snuck a peek at me from across the table, then quickly looked down again and typed. Gigi, I don't think you look like a frog. Well, maybe a little. Frogger, it's okay. I totally do and know it. Hey, you know why frogs are so happy being frogs? Gigi, question mark. Frogger. They eat whatever bugs them. I got that from a joke book. So what's with your cat from your worst nightmares that clearly is not a cat? Did you draw it yourself? GG. Yes. Frogger. You got skills. I'm impressed. My only talents are looking like a frog and sharing frog puns. And shoot. I just realized what I should have made my username. GG. Question mark. Frogger. Hermit the frog. Brandon. Okay, everyone. Time to switch partners. 
Finish up your conversations, Frogger. Oh, dang. Well, it was nice chatting with you, Gigi. Can I call you Gigi? I really enjoyed seeing your art, too. Gigi. Me, too. Take care, Frogface. Okay, so it's not an actual conversation, but we were technically IRL. Which means I interacted IRL with a girl who's not my mom, or me looking back from a mirror. A cute girl. Go me. Once I got out the door though, the anxiety hit me in a wave. The worst anxiety I've felt in forever, really. It literally felt like eyes watching me, following me. My nerves didn't stop until I got home and even then, after I wrapped up tight in my blankets like a caterpillar into its cocoon, it took a long time for that unsettling feeling to fade. Week 5. Today is our conversation class. And I'm so terrified at the thought of speaking to Gigi aloud instead of through the keyboard that just the thought drenches me in sweat. Upper lip sweat, armpit sweat, under boob sweat. I can never meet her. Unless it's in the rain so she can't tell how sweaty I am. But why would we meet in the rain? I'm doomed. Maybe I'll make a joke about my exceptional sweat glands and how frogs are moist. No, don't use the word moist. Do I want to chase her away forever? Why, why am I so bad at life? I pull everything out of my closet looking for the right outfit. Something that will magically make me cute. I settle on a green hoodie with frog eyes on top of the hood. And the front of the hood zips closed over my face like a frog mouth. Which will allow me to hide when I inevitably embarrass myself in front of the whole world. Perfect. It says I'm on my way to class, the anxiety kicks in so hard that once again, I feel eyes on me staring, but whenever I whirl around, there's no one. It's just nerves. At the coffee shop, I find a new double-sided name tag. One side reads, Frogger. The other shows my cat picture. Brandon tells us cat side up means quiet. Name side up means talking. He encourages us to start with our names and only turn into cats if we need a break. About half the class start as cats anyway. We are down to only eight students. Moist. I keep thinking in my sweltering hoodie, wishing I could shunt the word out of my brain forever, but unfortunately, it's how I am and how I feel. Kill me. I almost sigh in relief when I'm not paired with Gigi even though I'm desperate to look into her beautiful sad eyes and joke. Look, we're the princess and the frog. Except the frog never turns hot. Instead, I'm paired up with some guy whose name tag reads Dark Lord. He's tall and hunched and has this, uh, dark stare. Seems to be going for Kylo Ren vibes, but a lot nerdier and way less jacked. His cat picture is a low-res black cat with laser eyes. We've been given conversation cards to facilitate our interactions, but he only glares down at his cards, not making eye contact. Finally, he mumbles. I'd watch out for her. Huh? I say. Haven't you noticed? Intensely stares at cards. She doesn't breathe. And even though I'm melting in my hoodie, suddenly I'm chilled. I try to sneak a glance over at Gigi. When I look back at Dark Lord, he's eyeing me with such a burning intensity I feel my skin crawl, but he quickly drops his gaze and reddens. He really can't look anyone in the eye, apparently. After a few more partner swaps, Gigi is my last conversation for the day. She still has her name tag on the cat side and looks utterly shattered by the conversation exercise, apparently. She just can't bring herself to make so much as a peep. Her face is red and her eyes damp. And even though it's her turn to start by reading a question from a card, it's obvious that isn't going to work for her. I have an idea. And I reach over and tap the top question on her list. What is your name? Then I point to myself, tugging my frog hoodie and circling my face with a finger. Frog face. She peers at me from beneath lowered lashes. I show her the first question card on my list. 
where are you from? She shakes her head. I try another one, sifting through the conversation questions, and hold one up for her. What's something you really like? She looks at me, and then points to me. You like... me? I blurt. Her eyes widen, and I suddenly realize what she means. Oh, oh geez. You're asking me to answer the question about what I like, not telling me that you like... uh... I zip up my hoodie so that she's just looking at a green fabric frog face now. My cheeks are on fire. It is really unbearably hot in this room. I think I might die right here. But then I hear a sound that breaks through the fire and makes my heart lift. A very soft tinkle of laughter. Gigi is laughing. I mean, I'm still going to go and die of shame when I get home, but at least I'll die knowing I made her giggle. And then I feel a soft tug on my hoodie. The zipper opens and a wave of cool air rushes in as her small fingers open up the front. Brandon is calling us back to order and saying class is going to wrap up and we'll meet next week. As I'm packing up my bag, I glance back to Gigi and she's watching me. She points at her question card, the one I pulled out about something you really like, and then points back to me, and then she turns and quickly darts out. My heart. It's bursting. Week 5, post-class. I'm just about to set off for home when a bell jingles behind me, and the coffee shop door opens and the barista yells, Hey! I'm already in my introvert bubble. Let's be real, I'm always in my bubble, and having it popped by this apron barista, whose face is making loud words at me, shatters me into a panic. Oh no, I think. My palms sweat and my throat closes up. Unfortunately, I already made eye contact, so I'm trapped. Suddenly I notice the tablet he's waving, and the stickers on it. It belongs to Gigi. Finally, the sounds tumbling out of his lips register. One of your classmates forgot her tablet. Not knowing what else to do, I hold out my hand. My internal monologue flares up. What if he thinks you're trying to steal it? What if he takes the opportunity to strike up a conversation? You'll have to pretend to faint, and when he goes in to get water for you, wake up and run away. But the employee smiles and says, Thanks and hands me the tablet and heads back inside, and I breathe a sigh of deepest relief. Well, I survived that. The sky overhead is a deep and beautiful purple, the stars just coming out to twinkle, and as I recover myself, looking up the street for Gigi, it feels like they're shining just for me. I spot her tiny form retreating in the distance and I follow her. For once, I don't have that feeling of eyes on me, watching me. It must be because my nerves are finally settling. Am I becoming a better, braver frogger? I fantasize about handing her tablet back to her, our hands touching. No, she will snatch her fingers away in disgust, and God, even my fantasies are a fail. Um, I fantasize about smiling and tucking my sweaty hands back into my pockets after I hand her tablet to her, and offering to walk her home. But with each passing step, it feels less romantic. More like I'm just a stalker, if she'd only turn around for a second so I could wave. I should just go home, keep our interactions safely online, and I'm about to do just that when my phone pings. Dark Lord, look. Dark Lord, picture, picture. I click the links and open two images that I stare at for several moments in confusion. The first is a class of 1993 yearbook photograph, the hairstyles and clothes outdated. The second is a senior photo from that same yearbook, with the name Genevieve Grayson. Genevieve looks exactly like Gigi. Frogger. Whoa, is that her mom? Dark Lord. Are you an idiot? It's her. His insistence on some girl from a 30-year-old yearbook being Gigi seems ridiculous. It has to be a relative. 
I mean, it looks exactly like her, but for that to be Gigi herself would be impossible. And yet, a shiver creeps along my spine, because it's not just a resemblance. The girl in the yearbook photo looks, well, identical. Something isn't right here. Something isn't... watched. I feel like I'm being watched. I glance around and then I tuck the tablet into my bag. I've lost all trace of Gigi. I'll have to message her about the tablet later, but now, now as I turn and hurry home, I'm certain I hear footsteps behind me, certain that eyes are on me, following me, that something is drawing nearer and nearer. Meanwhile, my phone is pinging again and again. I risk a glance and see Dark Lord messaging me. Dark Lord. Have you noticed how the class keeps shrinking? Dark Lord, I got the class list from the teacher. Well, stole it. Dark Lord, anyway, people aren't dropping. Dark Lord, they're disappearing. I found missing persons reports. I tried to tell Teach, but he thinks I'm a conspiracy theorist. So I looked myself. That girl you got the hots for? Frogger? On the class list, her name is Genevieve Grayson, same as that yearbook, and guess what I found out about Genevieve? Frogger, are you still there? Are you home? Are you safe? Frogger, emailing you. I'm running now, the phone in my pocket, the shadows, the shadows seem to be closing in around me. That feeling of being watched has intensified so much I swear I can see eyes glinting out at me from the dark. The chill has penetrated to my bones and as I run, the thud of my footsteps, either there's an echo or thud thup, thud thup. For a second set of footsteps, just under mine, hidden almost to be inaudible by the pounding reverberations. Someone running after me, almost at exactly my pace, but ever so slightly with each step, Catching up. Finally, my apartment building looms. Relief floods me, and I dash toward the bright glare of the exterior building lights. For a moment, I feel the presence of that icy chill like a wind raking my back. And then I'm inside, rushing up the stairs. Bursting into my apartment and slamming the door shut, locking it. After several moments, I finally take out my phone in shaking hands. Frogger, I'm home. I think someone followed me. Frogger, what are you going to tell me about Genevieve? There's no response, so I go to my desk and Google Genevieve Grayson. And as I sit there staring at my screen, my blood runs cold. Because when I do find her yearbook photo, it's true. Genevieve Grayson looks exactly like Gigi, but according to Google... Genevieve has been dead for nearly 30 years. Week 6. I'm really freaked out. Like, so freaked out. The morning after I had that scare running home, I tried to contact Dark Lord, but he wasn't answering. The email he sent me the night before had attachments of missing person reports. These matched the list he sent of our classmates' names and contact info that I guess he stole from the teacher. He was right about our classmates disappearing. But the worst news came later. After I was checking the local news, I started looking because I was searching for more missing person reports. And there was a headline that caught my attention. Maimed body of slain man found outside apartment. The body of Xavier Rodriguez, 27, was found disemboweled outside of his apartment late Monday night. Gazing at the image of the man in the newspaper photo, I felt my heart drop to my toes, because it was Dark Lord. Looking out at me with his trademark intense stare, and in his arms was a cat, the black cat with the laser eyes from his picture. Apparently it was his actual pet cat, and somehow it's this little detail that makes it all seem so much more horrifically real. Should I call the police? Tell them that Xavier was trying to warn me about something the night he died? I'd never be able to sit through an interrogation. 
I consider telling Brandon, but Xavier tried and got dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. By the time class rolls around, I've done nothing. Pathetic, I know. When I arrive at the coffee shop, almost an hour early, the bell jingles above my head and the barista smiles in greeting. I duck my head and then I see Brandon, his pleasant face brightening. Frogger, you're early. I haven't ordered drinks yet. Would you like to order your own? Or are you a quiet cat today? Can I talk to you? Sure. He comes over and sits at a corner table with me, leans in and asks in his gently affirming way, What's up? Already I am sweating like mad in my frog hoodie. I lean in and Brandon furrows his brow in that concerned way of his and I blurt out, Xavier thinks we're all in danger and now he's dead and we have to call the police and ambush Genevieve because she doesn't breathe. Oh. He already looks like he doesn't believe me. My face is red, hot, and flushed. I open up my messenger app and show him the messages I exchanged with Xavier, as well as the yearbook pics of Genevieve and the news article about Xavier's death. I don't know what to say, he admits when he finally does speak, shaking his head. This is all so... After a pause, he asks, why did you wait until now to tell me? Aren't you usually much more comfortable communicating by messages? I don't want her to know, and I was worried she might have some way to... I don't know. I mean, Xavier hacked your site and got access to your class roster. What? I just didn't want her to find out beforehand and come after you or me. I drop my eyes. Feels like a betrayal, talking about Gigi this way. I have to remind myself that she's not Gigi, she's Genevieve, and she's much, much older than the 19-year-old she appears to be. Did you go to the police? Asks Brandon. I shake my head. I'm pretty sure they'll go through his emails and messages to find his killer. I can't really add anything. What I don't say is that I could barely blurt out the truth to Brandon, let alone officers in an interrogation room. I'd probably just look guilty and they'd wonder if I had something to do with it and then arrest me for murder and I'd be too terrified to open my mouth to defend myself. And while my mind is tunneling ever deeper down this rabbit hole, Brandon is talking again. I'll message everyone that class is postponed until further notice. Meantime, you go straight home and message me that you got home safe. Actually, he rubs his chin. I'd better walk with you. Come on. We head out into the early evening, and even though I am bundled up with a scarf over my frog hoodie, the wind is biting and makes my eyes weep. Brandon interrogates me about my disappearing classmates. Who else I've told, and I'm mumbling my answers when my flesh prickles. What is it? Brandon stops. Eyes, I whisper. Someone's watching us. He looks all around. You must be imagining it. There's no one out here. When I insist that someone is watching us, he considers for a moment, and then tugs my wrist and pulls me into a trot, saying we'll take a shortcut. We move quickly, ducking into an alley. I still hear the echo of footsteps, feel the weight of eyes, but then the feeling vanishes as we turn a corner. Brandon takes us further away from the street deeper into the back alley between buildings, and finally stops by the dumpster at the rear of what seems to be a warehouse. Still feel eyes? He asks. I shake my head. That's good, Brandon says in his mellow, reassuring voice. I wouldn't want there to be any witnesses to your imminent demise. Huh? His words register too late. And then I'm on the ground. Struggling for air because he has me pinned. He smiles and his teeth are long, sharp, and there are too many of them to fit in his mouth. He lifts a hand to wipe away the saliva that dribbles down his chin, and his eyes have a feral glow. Xavier got too close, he remarks. I had to get rid of him. Didn't realize he showed all his findings to you. The thing about shut-ins, though, 
that makes you such wonderful pickings is that you never go to anyone for help every time, every class, if there's anyone suspicious. And usually there isn't, but if there is, you always come to me. A shame, Frogger. You made real progress. I'd be proud of you if you didn't smell so delicious. His teeth have gotten too long for his mouth, and warm wet droplets fall onto my face. And then it's back. Eyes. Watching me. Soft footsteps. I look past my slavering professor, and behind him stands a girl, pale in her gothic makeup. Brandon's head turns. She looks down at me, then at Brandon. He wipes his face and his teeth retract enough for him to growl. Nice of you to join class, Genevieve. My worst student. Here with my best. You know your classmate here thinks you're immortal. A shame she doesn't have my sense of smell. Or she'd know better. He inhales deeply and smiles. A smile that cracks his face wider than should be possible. Revealing that those teeth run in rows deep into his skull. Then he tells her to please wait and not run and make him chase her. I hate exercising before dinner. When he turns back to me, his jaws open wide enough, it seems he might swallow my head whole. Stop. It's a whisper, but the first word Gigi has ever spoken. To my shock, Brandon does stop. He blinks and turns. What's that? He looks at her, and his eyes have gotten wide, nostrils flaring as he sniffs the air, as if he smells something on her breath. She inhales deeply, clenching her fists and yells, Stop! The world explodes. I don't know how to describe it. It's like the word leaves her body, and in the air becomes a great dark mass of blackness, shadow given form, and at the same time her real body, her human body, collapses like a deflated balloon. And the thing that emerges from her voice expands like spilled ink across my vision, stretching up and above us. And for just an instant, as it looms, all solid black except for vaguely pointed ears and the flashes of white that might be teeth, I recognize it. The cat she used for her name tag picture. Cat Gigi. But of course it's not Cat, and never was. And apparently now that it's been freed by her voice, Brandon can definitely smell it, because in the instant before it envelops us, he springs, leaping with a shocking agility away from me and up the side of the building. But that liquid shadow spills upward just as fast, and his screams vanish into gargling. There is a crunching and squelching, and blood rains down on me, and then I hear screaming, and this time, this time it is my voice, and I'm running, running as fast as my legs will carry me. Graduation. Brandon's corpse has not been found. He's been listed as a missing person, just like all my classmates. The only exception is Xavier. If I had to guess, Brandon was interrupted at the scene and fled to avoid being caught by someone who wasn't a shut-in. It's been weeks, and I still haven't told anyone all of this. Who would I tell? Ironically, even though Brandon's class didn't make me an extrovert, I've gotten better at things like grocery shopping. I guess after the last lethal lesson, well, I found there are scarier things in the world than small talk. Though it's still in my top 10. Oh, also, Gigi messaged me. Gigi. Hi. Hope you're okay, frog face. Sorry if I scared you. Me. Sorry for thinking it was you disappearing people. I was completely suckered by Brandon. Gigi. It's okay? Me. So it was you following me all those times. Watching me. Gigi. Yes. Me. You knew what Brandon was and were trying to protect me. GG. Honestly, I had no idea about our teacher. The truth is, I followed you because I like you. You seem sweet. 
I'm sorry I shouldn't have been following, I just took the class because I have no friends. Me. Oh, well, kinda glad you did. If you hadn't, I'd probably be dead. GG. You're not mad, Frogface? Me. No, I actually, um... I followed you too the other night. Wasn't trying to stalk you, but you left your tablet. Me. So you're not gonna try to eat me? Have frog legs for dinner? GG. No. Me. What about that super scary monster? Cat GG. GG. If I don't use my voice, it sleeps. Me. So we can be friends? GG. Yes. Me. Okay, well... I have to give your tablet back, so how about we meet next week? Like... like we do in class. I'll order your drink for you so you don't have to talk. We can call it our graduation. GG. Yes, please. Me. We'll have a hopping good time. Shut up. She thinks my jokes are cute. So, my new friend might be a monster. And she did just eat our teacher, but you know what? I'm cool with that.